God is good. <coughs> and, uh, you know, we would like to welcome our friend, my my friend, uh, Apostle Alidi, is from South Africa. He's a man who travels, and he has got a church in South Africa. He got few friends in South Africa. He's one of them, and today he's with us, and uh, he's going to bring God's word to our lives. Shall we give a fond with welcome to him so he can come and minister to us? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, I always ask people when I come for the second time to just make sure that I was here last time I was around. Who was here when I was here last time? Do you still remember what I said, when I said what I said, what I said, when I said what I said last time? <laughs> How many remember what I said? What scripture did I preach about? Yes. But then I was forgotten. No one remembers. If I was going to give a prize to anyone who remembers, maybe I put a pounds into it. You, you can't remember. Not why. I, I, I am very grateful this morning to be with you. I bring you greetings from South Africa. Uh, I was given uh, a clearance with Pastor Sam. He said, if I preach what I preached last time, no one is going to shoot me. <laughs> so if I do a revision, I'm still in the safe zone, right? That's his assurance for me. Uh, I'm so, so happy to be with you. And uh, it's always a pleasure. God connected me with uh, my brother here, uh, La Pastor Sam. So when I come around, I always say, can I come over? And he's so gracious to say, come. And uh, it's great to fellowship with him, met his family, and met you guys. I'm so humbled even to just stand here this morning. I'm just going to share with you some few thoughts. I don't know if I have a title for those thoughts. You don't mind, right? I'll just say something to encourage you, amen. I, I hope you will be encouraged. May God bless you. Uh, it is true, indeed, that when Pastor Sam started talking about a place of refreshing, I, I, this morning I felt refreshed as I walked in here. I don't know about you, but it is good to, to note that coming into the house of God is not a religious act. It's a reality. It's a place of a reset. God always wants us to be refreshed, to be reset, to be revived, to be renewed, to be restored. I believe in the rees of God, R-I-E, the rees of God, because whatever God is doing, it's a re-job. It's a reset, it's a revival, it's a renewal, it's a refreshing, because if we noticed that the original intent of God when he created us was that we may be just like him. The Bible says, God said, let us make man in our own image. The word image in Greek is the same word with shadow. So God wanted to make somebody just like him, his shadow. So that was God's original intent when he created man, that he be created in his image. So if he created us then in his image, if we are his shadow, then we are the visible manifestation of the invisible God. So whoever sees us, sees God. We must touch on behalf of God. We must speak on behalf of God. We must be just like our father is because when Adam was created, when God created Adam, he placed him in a place called Eden. The word Eden means the presence. So we were created to be in the presence of God. 
who were created to be just like God. So when Pastor Sam was speaking this morning, he spoke things that just kept my heart connecting with a few things. The few things that he kept on triggering in my spirit was he spoke about refreshing. He spoke about faith. And he also spoke about the glory. So those three things stood out very much in my, in my mind because I had no plans really to speak about a particular subject. Therefore, when he was speaking those things, it just made me to maybe try and talk along those lines. Maybe those dots at some point will connect. Maybe that will be my message. Is that okay with you? Uh, uh, when Adam was placed in the presence of God or in a place called Eden, it was just like a portal, a place where God came and communed with him. So indeed we are gathering in a building here, but it's not really a building. It's a place where God comes and commune with us or communicates with us. It's a portal or the day we gave our life to Jesus. By the way, that song the worship team did, it just made an impression in my spirit and I'm still singing it within me. I surrender all to you. Uh, surrendering our lives to the Lord uh, is the beginning of our journey of reconnecting with God. Am I still with you? Uh, you know, I'm from, I'm from South Africa. In South Africa, we say amen. So I'm trying to adjust to your, you know, British style of worship where you just look at me as I'm Mr. Bean. So just please give me an indication that at least you are hearing me. I know I've got an African accent. Can you understand me at least? You can. All right. Okay, just give me some indication. Just wave or just nod so I know I'm, I'm on the track. Okay, buddy. Okay, buddy. Good. Yeah. So what I'm saying is it's a portal. It's a place where God came and communicated with Adam every evening. He came. So Eden was the presence of God. So we were created to be in the presence of God. So when we give our lives to God, or when we surrender our life to Jesus, we are brought back to where we're supposed to be. We are taken back to the original intention of God, that we were supposed to be just like him. Amen? We we're supposed to be just like him. Sin defiled us. When sin came in, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when man was created, he was created to live in the presence of God. The word glory means the manifest presence of God. Fish lives in the water. God lives in a realm called glory. When you take fish out of water, it dies. We die when we don't have oxygen. We cannot survive without that. So God lives in a realm called glory. So when God said, let us make man in our own image, you will need to, find, to, 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 to check this out quickly. God, heaven, and earth. So when God said, let us make man in our own image, he was speaking of what was in heaven that it should be on the earth. Am I still here? That's why Jesus said, pray for the kingdom of God to, what? to come from what? From heaven to earth. So God wanted earth to be just like heaven. What was that? Heaven is a place of the manifest presence of God. It's a place of glory. God lives in the glory. So when Adam was created, he was living in the glory. Adam uh, was sinless when he was in that realm. Until sin came in, he was cut off or he fell short of the glory. Am I still at home? Am I still at home? So what happened then was uh, uh, God had to do a reset here to bring Jesus to die for us on the cross 
so that when we surrender our lives to him, then we are taken back to where we're supposed to be in the glory of God. Is that right? So heaven, God, heaven, earth. So the finishing of the earth came from heaven. So everything that was on earth came from heaven. So heaven, God wanted earth to be just like heaven. So if there's glory in heaven, he wanted glory on earth. So he wanted a representative which had all the attributes of God. That's why God left even the naming of the animals to Adam. Adam, whatever say he said, it was in agreement with what? With heaven because he was the one who was put in charge of the affairs of earth before sin came in. So sin defiled us. Uh, and the gospel informed us or informs us or it tries to take us back to where we were before the fall. Where were we before the fall? Before the fall, we were in God because we came from God. We were created in the image of God. We are the shadow of God. So whatever God had, we had. Am I still at home? Am I still at home? So the gospel is the good news that we can be brought back to that relationship, which is the river. The relationship, there's a river that flows from the throne of God. Wherever it goes, it brings forth healing. That's why when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well of Samaria, he said, uh, out of your innermost bellies shall flow rivers of living water. When we reconnect with God, we become alive. We don't become religious. We become children of God. And when I'm a child of God, I'm just like my father. Can I talk to somebody? My father is full of the glory. Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. He went on to say, his kingdom is not in word, but in what? In power. For he said, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Are we still at home? Don't make me preach like an African because I feel that African thing coming on me. We scream a lot. I want to be like you guys. I want to talk today. Can I talk? Or can I preach? What must I do? Do both. Okay, I'm doing fine on time. All right. Uh, so when Adam was placed in that place called Eden, uh, until sin came in, uh, he fell short of the glory of God. There's one thing about the glory of God that I like is in the glory of God, everything is done. I don't know if I say it right. In the glory of God, everything is what? Is done. Because God really finishes something before he begins it. He declares the beginning from the end. He declares the end from the beginning. Okay? We say the other way. God declares you to be what you're supposed to be, and then he creates you. So you're just discovering what God already intended you to be. Amen. A bit confusing. Let me try and clear that out because I hear so many questions. Let me answer those questions before I can continue. When God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden, he then said it is not good for him to be alone. Let me make him a what? A helpmate suitable for him. Then he made him to sleep and took uh, out of his rib and made a woman, which means extracted from man. Woman means extract from man. From man. And uh, basically when he did that, uh, how old was Eve when she was presented to Adam? It's just a question. Was she a teenager? Was 14 years old? Nine years old? She was already a fully grown Lady, is that right? So when you're in the presence of God, while you're still speaking, things are already happening. Before you saw, you're already reaping. Am I still in the house of God? So Eve, when she came, because in the presence of God, everything is already done. It's not going to happen. It's already done. Amen. That's why when we come into this place, it's a place of refreshing because while we are already praying, what we are praying for is already done. Amen. 
Okay, that's, t- that's tempting. Let me try and read the scripture because I don't want to. Uh, okay, Pastor Sam, there's so much of the presence of God that I don't know where to go. There's so much in my spirit that I'm trying to be obedient. Is that okay if I can just, because I, I have so much to say and I'm trying to stick into one lane. Now I see five lanes ahead of me. Questions here, questions there. Can I just read the scripture then I can answer a few? Is that okay? All right, let's do this. Genesis chapter uh, 12. Uh, I'm going to connect these dots, these dots quickly. And now the Lord had said to Abraham, that's verse 1, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. That's verse 1. Verse 2, and I will make a great nation and I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Amen. Did I not read this scripture when I came last time? No, it's not. All right, let's see the three things that I'm seeing here. God says, I'll make what? You a great nation. I'll make your name great, and I'll bless thee. Three things, right? Great name, great nation, and blessing. Is that right? That's right. I'm seeing the same thing. What happened here was when God called Abraham, he told him to leave his country and go to a place where God was going to show him. And God gave him a threefold prophecy that he was going to be a great name, a great man, a nation, and he was going to have a great name, and he was going to be blessed. Amen? When we talk about the church, we are Abraham's children. There is a song that we used to sing in Sunday school that Father Abraham had many sons and I'm one of them. So are you. Why? Because Abraham is the father of faith. The Bible says by faith, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. So our relationship with God begins by faith in God. When we respond to God, when we surrender our lives to God, our journey is reset. We all understand the the concept of reset, right? Monday to Sunday and Monday it's a reset. After every seven days there's a what? There's a reset. Every seven days there's a what? A reset. So God reset our life when we come by faith to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, what happens there, there's a threefold blessing that Abraham was given. It was through faith. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to what? To please God. However, Adam did not need faith to receive from God because he lived in a different realm. He lived in the presence of God. When we are in the presence of God, we don't need faith. Someone once said, have faith, or the Bible says, have faith in God. It's a bit difficult to tell somebody to have faith in God. We know the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. The word of God. Yes, faith is what causes us to receive from God. Faith is the currency that buys us whatever we want from God. But that scripture that says have faith in God, it's better interpreted in the original. It simply means have the faith of God. How do I have then faith? I have to have faith of the the faith of God when God himself imparts that faith into me. Because it's difficult to have faith because you can have faith and unbelief at the same time. What is faith? Faith is a gift of the Spirit. The Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Which means Jesus is the beginning and the end of our faith. The scripture says by looking unto him, who Jesus. So when I begin to relate with Jesus, faith comes to me supernaturally. Because faith is supernatural. 
You cannot just have faith by mimicking or imitating or reciting the word or reciting scripture. Faith is imparted to us by relationship with Jesus. The moment I begin to relate with Jesus, the faith of God begins to operate in me. When the faith of God begins to operate in me, I begin to receive whatever God wants me to receive. Amen. Now, Adam did not have faith because he lived in a different realm. He was in the glory of God. Now, God said to Abraham, uh, I will bless you. I will make your name great and I will make you a great nation. So, the church is a nation within a nation. The word church comes from the word, from a Greek word which is called eclosia, which means called out. God called us out of the world of sin. By faith we responded. We became a nation. The church is not a local assembly meeting at St. Thomas. Yes, we are part of that, but the church is invisible because if Jesus is your Lord and Jesus is my Lord, you are my brother. Is that right? So the faith that we have in God makes us to become Abraham's children. And Abraham was given a promise by God when God said to him, uh, I will make your children to be like the sand of the seashore and like the stars of heaven. The sand of the seashore represents the natural Israelites. And the stars of heaven represent the spiritual Israelites. We are the spiritual Abraham's descendants. Okay? Now, now that we are Abraham's descendants, it puts us in that category now that we belong to a, to a great nation. Can you say great nation? Yes. So that great nation comes by way of a faith that we inherited, which Abraham had. But I want to present to you this morning that faith is not all that we need to have. When we came to Jesus, when this reset began, it's not going to just reconnect us to be a people who operate in supernatural faith. Yes, we need faith. What is faith? Faith is the ability to believe God uh, for what we want. It's supernatural imparted. Uh, 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 and there's something more than faith, which is the glory of God. Or there's something else called what? The glory of God. Let me put it in this category. Can you say faith? The anointing and the glory. Yes. Because you, 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 you kick-started this thing when you were talking about the glory, you were talking about faith. So I began to see this in my spirit. How do I see it? I see it this way. The first man, Abraham, believed God. Okay? And he was created to him for what? For righteousness. But we see that the journey of God and Abraham did not end with Abraham uh, and God. Abraham's son, Isaac, had two children. Come on. Is that right? Okay. Abraham got one son, but Abraham got, uh, Abraham's son got what? Two sons. And we find out that Abraham's son got how many sons? Twelve sons. So it gets better. So what God begins, it gets better. It, or is a, it is a transgenerational God. He's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's a God of Faith, anointing, and the glory. But you see that in this category, the glory is supposed to be the first. Okay? Because when God created man, he created him in his image. Man had the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of what? Of the glory of God. So God is not trying to reset us to operate by faith. He's not trying to reset us to operate by the anointing. He's trying to get us back to what? To operate in the glory. When, when we are in the glory, everything is done. There is a higher dimension than glory, a higher dimension than the anointing. Let me take you to the anointing quickly because of my time. Okay, where are we? All right. There is an Old Testament Pentecost and a New Testament Pentecost. On the mountain of Sinai, God came. There was 
a lot of commotion that took place there because God came. When he came, he commanded or he told Moses to tell the children of Israel not to come near all of their animals lest they die. God came and did a show up and a show off here there. What was happening there? At that place, God uh, uh, married Israel. The Bible says Israel is God's, first, God's wife. Why? Because there was a covenant. Marriage is simple means a covenant. One become, two becoming what? One. So what God had promised Abraham was confirmed on what? On Mount Sinai when Israel became one with God. How did he become one with God? He did not become one with God in Abraham. He became one in God in Jacob because Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes. So the confirmation came in Jacob that uh, God came on Mount Sinai and with his presence and with his anointing, Israel became God's wife. But watch this. On the mountain, when, the Holy, when, when God came, it was representing the Holy Spirit. And there's another mountain. He was talking about the mountain. Blame him for all this I'm doing. He studied all this. There's something similar that happened in the New Testament when they were in the upper room. Is that right? When the day of Pentecost had fully come. That was on Acts chapter 2, right? Uh, they were in an upper room and they, there was heard a rushing of a what? Of a mighty wind and cloven tongues of fire came upon them and they all spoke in tongues and the Spirit of God gave them utterance. You see now that uh, in the Old Testament, God came on Mount Sinai. On, 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 on the day of Pentecost, what came? The Holy Spirit. Is that right? Jesus said you must tarry until you are what? filled with the power from on high. So the Holy Spirit came on Mount Sinai. Is that right? So we see God and we see the what? The Holy Ghost coming. Is that right? You seeing that too? Now there's something that has not happened. Jesus has not yet come. So we've seen the Holy Spirit. We have seen, so we've seen God come in Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. We've seen the church of Jesus being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the anointing. But we have not seen the glory of God. We are living in a season where the glory of God is going to show up. Come on, talk to me. I said, come on, talk to me. Pastor Sam says, God shall supply all our needs according to the anointing. Come on. God will supply our needs according to the? Uh, no, by faith. It's not by faith. Because I've heard people say, my anointing is like this. There's so many people who are claiming to be more anointed than the other. I don't know if you are not in that realm, but in, in South Africa, or if not experience of people that claim to be in those realms. It's not the anointing that we should be emphasizing. It's not our greatness of our faith that we should be uh, emphasizing. It's the glory of God. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is God working independent from us. When people come to church, God healing them without us doing anything. Come on now. When the glory of God is present, we don't need to do anything. God shall supply what? Some of our needs? Come on. God supplies what? All our, that's the reset God is trying to take us to. To have his glory means his manifest presence refreshing us all the time. That when we come into that relationship, everything is done. Am I still here? Jesus prayed in the book of John chapter 17 and said, Father, give them the glory that I had before the foundation of the earth. So Jesus had the glory before the foundation of the earth. Last time I checked, there was reading the Bible. Jesus was praying and said, Father, glorify your son. And God says, I have glorified him and I will glorify him again. 
So now when we are walking in his glory, all our needs are met. Why? Because we've gone back to where we were supposed to be. The original intention of God was that we be in the glory of God. Yes, I'm not saying we don't need the anointing. Come on, hear me well. The anointing simply means divine enablement. Even Jesus, the Bible says, God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with what? With the Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing good. Yes, when you pray for somebody, it's God's divine enablement that allows that person to get healed. We need the anointing. Okay, don't, don't misunderstand me. And we need faith. Don't misunderstand. Without faith, it is impossible to, uh, to, to, be, to, to receive anything from God. But I'm saying when we are in the glory, all is in the glory. Did I say my point now? All that faith is in what? In the glory. God still heals with faith, but not with our faith, but with his faith. Okay? In the glory, they still what? Faith, they still what? The anointing, but not our anointing, because the anointing is God's giving you divine enablement. But when the glory is there, it's God Himself doing what He would do when He is empowering you. That simple means you'll be what? Sitting and doing nothing while God is doing everything. I thought I made a point. I was trying hard. I'm working hard here. I thought I, thought I was working so hard. Let me show you this. Uh, uh, when, when God is doing everything, we don't have to do anything. In the garden, Adam did not have to do anything. God was doing what? Everything. It's sweatless. When the woman, woman that had an issue of blood touched Jesus' gown, what happened? Virtue left Jesus. When you are doing something under the anointing, it's you laboring. But when God is doing it, you're doing nothing. I was in our church this other Sunday. We were just worshiping God. The presence of God was so real. There's a lady in our church who said, I had an op. They took my kneecap, one of my kneecap, and they said I must come back now for, a op, for, for, for another surgery because they are ready now to, to replace it. I said, what do you want? They said, I don't want to go back. I just want my kneecap. Then I said, let's order one then. Because the presence of God was there. And we, honored, we ordered a new kneecap and God created a, a creative miracle before we know she was jumping around, she was dancing, she had a brand new kneecap. Are you getting my point? So when we are in the presence of God, God can give us organs. Body organs can be replaced. Eyes can be replaced. Why? Because the same God who created the heavens and the earth is able to do more than what we can ask him through the power that worketh in us. That's why Paul says, my God shall supply what? All your needs according to what? To his riches and glory. In the glory of God, we lack nothing. But you see, how is this going to be? This is going to be because we are back to the original intent of God, where he wanted us to be before the fall. Amen. I, I, I love what I'm talking about because uh, it was uh, Pastor Paul who started it, so you won't blame me for this. Uh, let me try and work. Okay. So Abraham is the father of faith who then made us to believe uh, uh, or, or to have the same DNA of trusting God so that God can bless us. But I want to say this to you before I sit down. God wants us to be total surrender. Tell anybody who wants us to be total surrendered. Do you believe that? Yeah. If we're going to be total surrendered, there's one thing we need to do. We need we need to be persistent. I saw a scripture earlier on. I think it's in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, verse 12. I thought it was relevant to what I'm saying. I hope you heard me this morning. Is it clear? Okay. All right. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. Is it up there already? 6, 12. Okay. I need to connect this and then I sit down. Hebrews 6, verse 12 says... Uh, be what? Be not slothful, right? But ye be not slothful, but followers of them 
through faith and patience inherited the promise. We need not to be lazy as we follow him. One of the things that robs us our blessings from God is we are very slothful. But the Bible is saying here, as followers, we need not to be slothful, but we must have faith and patience. So what gets us to the promise of what God intended us to have is faith. In order to get the promise, we mustn't be lazy. So there's a posture here of laboring, continuity. Amen? The Bible says pray without what? Without ceasing. So if you think everything will happen while you're sitting and doing nothing, all this we're talking about will become just a religious exercise. But if you are going to receive or obtain something from God, you need not to be what? To be lazy. You need to be through patience, follow through as Abraham did. Because when Abraham was called by God, what God called him to receive, he did not uh, get it overnight. It was through patience. He had to labor, he had to wait, he, he had to stand for those things that God was calling him for until they happened. There's a story in the book, second book of Kings, chapter 4, verse 24, with my five minutes bonus, uh, that there was a lady, the Bible calls her the Shunammite woman. You know that lady? I think that's what I spoke last time when I was here, was it? Not even that. I spoke about the Shunammite woman. I did? She remembered. He, all of a sudden, you, you, gave, you deserve a prize. Let's clap hands for him. He remembered. Good. At least somebody heard me. The Shunammite woman is a very interesting woman. They said she was in a place called Shunem, but there's some tragedy that happened to her because she received a miracle of a child. That child one day, uh, all of a sudden, got sick and that child died. And when that child died in verse 24, uh, she said to her husband before that, the build up of that verse, uh, to her servant, I want you to take me to the prophet of God and she said to her, to, to, the, to, the, to, to the servant, then she settled an ass and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Can you say drive and go forward? Only two people heard me. Can you say drive and go forward? That, that, that's, that's a posture of trying to pursue someone with speed. Is that right? When you're driving forward, when you're driving, I don't know whether it's an automatic or a manual uh, 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 transmission car, when you are going forward in speed, it means you want what you, you want to receive to happen what? Fast. Am I, am, I, am I saying something? So in our following Jesus, we need to do what we need to do, and we need to do it in haste. So she said, drive uh, and go forward. Where was she rushing? There was an incident in her life that her child had died. So in our following Jesus, we need to choose company that will not slow us down. We don't need to hang around with people that will cause us to despise the things of value. The things that causes our walk with God to be activated, we need to hang out with people of the same mind or like mind people. When I am with Pastor Sam, every time I come around with him, I leave or go home, my spirit being edified. Because if God is going to bless you, he will connect you with someone. And if the devil is going to mess with your life, he's also going to connect you with someone. So in your following, to obtain the promises of God, you need not to follow with slothfulness. In other words, you don't have to be slow. You need to be somebody who is in a hurry, who knows my choices and the decisions that I'm, I make are determined by who influences my life. That's why even coming to St. Thomas, it's, it's a place where God has given you a, you a platform to receive what God has put in your vision and leader so that whatever you receive from this place will sharpen you to live in this generation with a purpose. You have to run with a purpose. Is that right? 
You don't just drive forward. This woman was going to someone whom she believed had a word for the situation. When she finally arrived there, the man of God came with him, prayed for her child, and the child was resurrected. Am, am I still at home? So you need to know that God is doing something. In Genesis, uh, sorry, in uh, 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 Psalm chapter 1, I think that's, that's, that's my last scripture. You know, normally as an apostle, they say you close three times. So this is my second one. So I'm still within my, my grace. Okay, Psalm chapter 1. Uh, I like this. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor in the seat of the scornful. Three things I'm seeing there as well. I'm seeing someone walking. I'm seeing someone standing. I'm seeing someone sitting. Okay? There are those that are walkers in this faith. Don't be a walker. God is looking for runners. Come on now. There are those that are what? Sitting. Don't be a sitter. God is looking for runners. And there are those that are standing. Don't be a stander. God is looking for what? For runners. Am I still at home? Why? Because when you are walking, you are on your way to standing. And when you are on standing posture, you are on your way to sitting down. So don't be slothful in your following. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I ran uh, uh, and I finished. So you must run and finish your what? Your race. And how you run and finish your race, you must know that what God has called you for, it doesn't require you to be sitting and doing nothing. Am I still at home? Am I still at home? Because there are so many people that are seated and doing nothing. An idle mind is the devil's workshop. If you are not doing anything, the devil will give you something to do. And if you're going to see anything, uh, you have to understand that the race before us requires not to be standing. So the Bible says, blessed is the man that sitteth not. So when you are not sitting, uh, 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 when you standeth not, when you are not standing, uh, you must be doing something, you are running. Okay, standing. You are not running. I'm closing. I just said something that I wrote here before I came this morning. The rest that is before us needs to be understood. God is taking us back to the original intent, to his original intent, and you and me, we are privileged to be part of that walk. And I am here to encourage somebody that in this walk, in this race that we are in, you have to be like Samuel. Samuel, in the book of Samuel, chapter 1, verse 17, he was running as instructed. His father, Jesse, said, run to your brethren and go and give them food. You remember the story. It was a story of when Goliath was challenging the people of God, saying, give me one of your champions and I'll fight with him. If, I, if he loses, you become our slaves. But the message from from Jesse, the father of David, was, David, I want you to run to your brethren. So I'm saying this to say that, that we have a generation. If we are slothful, we'll miss it. If we are not running as instructed by God, this generation will not connect with God. So David, upon arriving where he was sent by his father, it was on the 39th day. If he was a bit slow, he was going to arrive there on the 40th day. 40, it's a number that speaks of a generation. What was happening, Goliath kept on coming to challenge the children of Israel. So if they had not, he was going to strike and Goliath was going to win and the whole generation was going to be enslaved. But when David came, not only was he sent by his father, it was prophetically that God, uh, God was sending him with an apostolic message to go and rescue the whole nation. You might think you came or you are in the United Kingdom or you are part of this church just so that you can die and go to heaven. No, 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 no. 
That is easy for God. God can make you to die the last day before you go to heaven and he'll take you to heaven. But God has called you to come into the kingdom of God in such a time like this so that you can be a light to this generation, so that you can be a salt to this generation. Church is not where we gather every Sunday. Church is where we scatter. Can I say that one more time? We have to redefine church. Church is not where we come every Sunday and say I was in church. You spend few hours in church on a particular given day, but most of your life you spend your time in the marketplace. You spend your time wherever you spend your time. That's where you must make an impact. You are an epistle written not by man's hand, but by God himself. That God wants you to make a difference. The people that are out there will die without God, without hope, if you do not manifest God. God has called you to become his member of his great nation who can release the power to heal, the power to restore, the power to share the gospel. It's not the pastor's work to reach out to the people in the community. It is you with your lifestyle that when you go to display what he teaches you here, the Bible says he gave some to be pastors, some to be apostles, teachers. In why? In order to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. The word saints is not, does not mean you have to die and then we call you saint, whatever, no. The word saint means to be called out, to be set apart for the master's use. So each and every one of us here have been called by God to represent God. God wants to use all of us. When he resets us to be children of God, we can represent him in his fullness, in his glory, where we scatter. God must demonstrate himself in our schools. God must demonstrate himself in our workplace. And you and I qualify for that. Am I still talking to somebody? So when David did his part, Goliath, Goliath fell down. Why? Because he ran as instructed. Tell me about run as instructed. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, I'm finished. Yeah, he says, wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight of sin which doth easily beset us and let us run with the patience. The rest that is set before us. In other words, we must run without sin. We must run with patience and we must run as instructed. The last scripture is 1 Corinthians 9 24. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Run that ye may obtain the prize. So you must run as instructed. You must run without sin. You must run with patience. And you must run to obtain the prize. After our work on earth is done, each and every one of us, we will be rewarded according to our labor. What are you doing in the house of God? Why are you here? If God has reset you to be a career of his glory, the glory supplies the needs. The glory heals the sick. The glory delivers those that are bound. So you are called by God to represent him because that's why you were created in the first place, to be his representative, to be the manifest presence of God on the earth, to be a visible manifestation of God on the earth. You may not need to pray for somebody literally. The Bible says in the New Testament, as they were walking, their shadows were healing the sick. Somebody is waiting to connect with God, and it is your life and my life that when we come into contact with those people, their lives will be transformed. When Saul came into the company of the prophet, he was changed into another man. Would it be possible that your cousins, your sisters, your brothers, your neighborhood needs you to connect with God in such a way that through your connecting with God, you will bring a transformation that can change their lives? Amen. Amen. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, thank you very much that what you have called us into is not a religion. It's a relationship. That, Father, we can be the source of refreshing to those that come into our lives and those that we come into contact with them. Father, we thank you for supernatural transformation 
that is taking place in the lives of the people, even those that will hear the sound of our voice, that Father, our coming to church will be a place of being serviced and being equipped to do the master's work. Father, we thank you even this moment that even as we hear your word, that Father, you are calling us into a relationship where you want to use our hands, our eyes, our lips, and our feet to touch on your behalf. We thank you, Holy Ghost, even for this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.